All right, well, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming in. Uh, I've heard your name, I've seen your name, scattered around in the New Zealand crypto scene for a while now. And uh, last year at that event, I had a chance to finally meet you. So thanks for agreeing to come come down. Can you just give us a quick uh, background? Uh, for example, how did you get into crypto or Bitcoin or whatever it is yeah. that, that you're into? Okay, cool. Yeah, so I used to be a banker uh, back in. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, that's, oh, my God, that's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I used to work for the, well, the CBA group, which is like the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Uh, essentially the parent of uh, ASB, yep. ASB Bank here in New Zealand. Um, and um, I was in the quantitative um, risk risk department over there. So I'm a quant modeler by, by trade. A quant modeler by trade. I mean, <laughs> I think I know what that means, but I don't. It's okay. You don't have to go into it. <laughs> and uh, as part of like some of the initiatives that I was doing back in 2016 with the bank, um, they started doing three things at that point in time, which was, so one of, one of it actually they had discovered Ethereum and what it was actually this thing, new network with programmability of smart contracts and what it was going to do for them. Um, and they wanted to explore that for issuance of um, debt securities. All of a sudden, we're talking about the same stuff that we're talking right now. Uh, this is so 2016 this era? Is 2016. Okay. Yeah, and um, so a kind of very first generation of STOs, if you will. Um, and, um, and at that point in time, so they did a project with the World Bank to issue the first private Ethereum node issuance of a bond on the blockchain with the World Bank. And I got involved in that project in that stage. And so like, whoa, this is interesting. And then um, there were a couple of other initiatives that actually started at that point in time. One of them was around things that we're still talking about today, like open banking. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's... Let's open the, the banks books and let's leave uh... all of this payment startups interact with the banks is it still not a reality no it yeah, seems it really seems like a utopia oh, open it, banking it's taking forever right oh in a lot of jurisdictions that has been regulated on banks in new zealand there has always been that kind of uh oh, we're gonna do it but let us do it uh, in our own time and 10 years later we're still not there right? yeah so, but anyways with the open banking and then i like i started actually putting the two things together i was working this innovation project on open banking at, at that point in time was just at the beginning in the local environment. Um, and um, and I said like, whoa, hold on a second. By the time this programmable technology here starts to actually to really be adopted, the open banking dream is gonna be obsolete completely. So I rather actually focus on this thing here that is about, you know, building, in my view, and it is still the main use case, financial market infrastructure in a programmable, real time, all the time way, rather than this other dream here that requires all of these intermediaries to essentially agree with each other actually to open their books and, and their, you know, and their APIs for the payments industry. I mean, that's an interesting point there, because you're right, they kind of ran in parallel there. Did Open Banking had a bit of a lead, actually, didn't it? Yeah, it did for quite a few years. Yeah, like, I mean, it's, we probably, like, I think some of the earliest initiatives in the Open Banking started being talking about in the UK back in, I think, 2014 or okay. something like that. So it's been already 10 years. And that's clearly not, I guess, a reality across the globe. There are some jurisdictions that are way more advanced in terms of what is it that the banking industry has done, a commercial banking perspective, but um, but a lot of them actually haven't. So anyways, coming back to the thread. Yeah. Um, so with that, there's another project actually came around, was already self-sovereign identity. Again, we're talking about some themes that come yeah, buzzwords, yeah. Spir is, is, is again. And uh, where I worked with, um, yeah, Paul Salesbury and, and a few other people. Yeah, Paul's yeah. been on on the pod. Yeah. He's, he's a very unique guy. Yeah, and yeah. then we when we kind of like started actually, you know, collaborating at that point in time, I said like, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna jump off the chasm out of the cushy job in banking and I'm gonna actually, you know, follow the road along with these engineers. At that point in time, I was also like following, you know, 
you know, meetups that was just like a bunch of devs doing stuff. Janine was there as well, you know, yeah. like Easy Crypto was still it's in early kind of like ideation stages and um and elsewhere. And then actually I went on and worked for actually for Blockchain Labs, which was the previous company that Paul um right. was um was doing at that point in time. And it was all low level engineering things, mostly kind of like a smart contract at the base level. There wasn't a lot of like the infrastructure that we that we see today. Right, they were doing like auditing smart contracts. Well, that sort it was of thing. it was a bit of both. So there was actually there was a part of it that was actually about auditing uh, companies um, and the smart contracts. So some of the names that we worked with at the point in time, there was like Shapeshift, who was actually a big player back in that kind of 2017 kind of like round. The Voorhees, he's one of he's yeah. one of my faves. Yeah, yeah so. he's. he's He's great. Yeah, so Shapeshift was a, was one of those, and then there was a few also projects um, that have become more scalable over time post that ICO kind of like boom and crash, and um, and one of them of course Shapeshift. There was some of them that actually had a very big promise, but actually they didn't necessarily realize over time T zero, which was actually also that first generation of STOs that were actually building, you know. T zero as in settlement, yeah, immediate. So, yeah, so T zero was about um, building infrastructure for real world assets on chain. Yeah, and um, and there was a lot of hype at that point in time. Again, that first generation of STOs, etc. And T zero was one of the leaders, along with Polymath and others, which were all related parties actually to the blockchain lab ecosystem. So it was interesting, you know, like it was it's a lot always of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So all of that stuff that we, you know, people that we were working together, either in a uh, auditing capacity or auditing and advisory, sometimes actually things actually mixed. And um, within blockchain labs also did a little bit of uh, infrastructure work. For example, atomic swaps between different blockchains, which wasn't something that we didn't have a multi-chain world at that point in time right? <laughs> so we were doing some of the earliest kind of there were a few chains yeah, yeah but they were changes i yeah. mean chains are still chains are still kind of islands i find yeah but we like to imagine yeah that's right yeah and there, there wasn't there weren't bridges there weren't any like the poa network all that kind of stuff that didn't exist right we were doing things at the edge um, you know, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes building, sometimes actually advising or auditing uh, companies. And anyways, came those two things together, my risk quant uh, background and the, actually the low level engineering stuff uh, in around, yeah, 2018, 2019, I, I started kind of like asking myself, okay, what's next, right? You know, like I, it's, it's really solid what we're we doing here, but at yeah. the same time we were at that point in time was like, treasuries that had been kind of like really raised through the ICO days, uh, through the ICO days, they hadn't been managed properly. This was uh, by a lot of projects. Like you say, a right? This, this has contributed to the boom bust. Boom uh, bust. It's significant. Like some projects actually raised a lot of money, like 150 million. I mean, if you put that in, in context, the Ethereum ICO raised 15 million in regard. Look at what they are right now. Right? right. And some of projects that were like 10x in terms of raise, actually, some of them don't exist anymore. Right. How can you manage your treasury so badly, right? It's, I mean, you, you've got to ask yourself, right? So, I'm reminded of like earlier this year with like AI companies that are just yeah. uh, repackaging chat GPT. And, and yeah. And, and to, to, your, to your point, right? Companies were coming up with an idea and a token yeah. and launching it on Ethereum. But like you say, Ethereum itself, you know, raised a fraction of a the money. A fraction that... of the money of a lot of those companies kind of like raised and contributed so much more than actually a lot of them actually did. Um, eventually, we don't know the end of the story because that story is still in building. But long story short, what it means is that then some of the kind of like those ICO treasuries is starting actually drying out because that wasn't actually managed or, or a lot of that it was actually through the tokens that were held in treasury rather than stable coins or whatever that they could manage a little bit more properly. Um, and um, and at that point in time, but all of that kind of like white paper, kind of like bloodbath and you say, what, what is the, what is tangible here out of all of this? 
And I started looking around and actually there were just a handful of projects at that point in time that were actually really coming out of the paper into something. One of them was MakerDAO. Another one was the previous generation of yeah. Aave. Heathland. Yep. Okay. Right. So, but oh, Heathland, that's right. Yeah. Heathland was a very, very kind of like, you know, clunky kind of like a project. It didn't work properly. It was really hard to actually to do. There wasn't a lot of liquidity in that in that protocol, etc. But Maker was starting to do something properly, and Maker had already started prior to Ethereum. So the project started in two thousand fourteen. So this is a great segue here. I asked you to come in today uh, to talk about stable coins. Yeah. Um, I also have kind of like an academic interest in, yeah. in stable coins. I think a lot of things about them are really interesting. I think the use case is crystal clear to me, although out there in the wider world, uh, it, it isn't. And other people, uh, you mm -hmm. know, do not see the application. Um, but aside from that, I was thinking, like, how should I try to, like, structure the chat today yeah. and when I was doing my notes it was kind of just like a ticker list of, of <laughs> stable coin tokens and I was like can I send him this but um I thought maybe uh, I was looking at the top stables by market cap mm. and I thought maybe just to give us an intro to stables and some of the differences we could look at these so the top three are tether USDC and then die so mm -hmm. can you give us like a, if I were to ask you like what's a stable coin and then how do you describe the differences between these three high level? Okay, cool. Sounds good. So um, just a little bit of like um, history. I mean, it should be a given for most of people actually listening to you nowadays, but uh, stable coins, the basic reason why they were created in the first place, it was to have an asset that wouldn't fluctuate over time the same way as as any of the other crypto assets, either those that actually are network or governance token. I mean, governance token came much later, but you know, so some asset that actually would be um, non-volatile asset, and that people could relate to the same way that they relate to their banking, uh, private money. We'll go we'll over that later. Yep. When I when I mention <laughs> private, private money, money, but. So that is the basic idea of a stablecoin. So to act as a as a similar payment network to the way that tra traditional actually fiat money actually goes through banking rails, and and that's the that's really the um, the basic um, work. From the top market cap stablecoins, they have different flavors of how they operate, right? So you have the ones like. USDT, USDT, USDC, and quite a few other variations of those across um, across lower market cap through 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 USD and others. Right. Um, they they all follow kind of like a, a more like a reserve backing mechanism that is backed by uh, cash and the equivalents of cash. It's not only cash. People are actually saying, "Oh, this is all fiat backed." No, no, it's it's a little bit more. To that, it's not um, right. If if it's like, yeah. if it's you and me, it's easy to say that things are backed by cash. But when you're talking about large volumes, uh, you're not necessarily going to have hundreds of millions of dollars of cash. Exactly, especially because cash at its base is a non yield bearing um, mechanism, right? So cash, if you think at its basics. You know, Oh, try not to go too deep into that stuff. We can go <laughs> back into sure. central banking maybe later, but. Um, Cash at its base is just a transmission mechanism. It doesn't require it to, to be paid a yield. Bond debt is a transmission mechanism that requires someone actually to hold on to it and pay you for a later stage based on the yields that that generates by actually by holding on time. So it's a bit different. That's why I'm using it's like yep. cash and cash equivalents. Cash equivalents, yep. There is actually a, a difference between the two. Um, most of these, you know, so those types of stable coins are like fiat, what I call fiat backed stable coins. Um, and they have like the cash and cash uh, equivalent backing. Uh, and also, usually, they have a governance framework that is uh, more centralized around an entity. That is the, mo the main manager of that network, and that has a number of 
uh, liquidity providers or market makers for actually for for increasing the issuance issuance or reducing the issuance of that stable coin. So that's the basic kind of like mechanism. Yep. And then we can go later into right. And so we need and other things like that. We need some government gov governance because some entity needs to hold these assets that are, that yeah. are backing it. And it's eventually liable for mismanagement of that, right? Of that governance structure or that is structuring of the structure. So that's why they slowly go towards the role of a, what a commercial banking and all its fiduciary requirements are. Yeah. Right? Despite so. the golden dream of decentralization. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, um, there was a lot of like, um, I guess, changes as well that in the way that the market operated. So for example, uh, just to speak of Circle, um, Circle was created as a consortium of different counterparties that would together manage the USDC stablecoin. It has evolved now. Now that consortium no longer exists. The liquid providers exist, but management at the center of the stablecoin that has been established. Not all of people should know about that. No, I don't know but about that. But Circle has communicated yeah. about this. Yeah. That they were actually winding down the, consor uh, the consortium for also for regulatory reasons, because they wanted actually to obtain licenses to be able to operate a little bit more deeply in the regulated world. Yeah. And so, and U USDC, I mean, the US part, they're backed by the US dollar, but they're also American, right? Is that, is that right? So the, the company, the original company is American, but now um, the backing in where it more fully operates are also in other jurisdictions across the world. Yep. And what, they, what they're trying to move towards, it's more like being jurisdiction resilient like for lack of a better word, yeah, yeah. a way of dealing with regulators that might not be looking at them too kindly, yep. like possibly in the US and in jurisdictions like this. So they've been kind of decentralizing where they sit, they are kind of like the, their strongholds and where they obtain licenses. So not only they can, you know, be potentially licensed by another central bank that is a little bit more or, or, or regulatory authority is a little bit more kind of like kind to them and willing for the innovation. Right, more accepting of how they're doing More things. accepting yeah. of all, how they're doing or simply, you know, um, um, being able to issue actually um, stable coins in that uh, jurisdiction. And so how do you see Tether has a lot of uh, media attention, uh, if you do a quick search, how do you see the difference? How do you see the difference between USDC and Tether? Yeah, so at the base level, they kind of like they're following the same kind of like framework of governance and and, and backing and and their goals. Um, on the on the intermediation level, they are very different because um, Tether here um, is is not as I guess transparent in terms of who are the banking counterparties that they are using to allocate their funds, who are the custodians, who, how is the structure behind the stablecoin actually work? You gotta be mindful that actually the stablecoin, the token itself is just the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. Okay. The majority of the structure in any stablecoin is underlying, is actually in off chain, kind of in the banking network rails. Right, traditional finance at the moment, world. At the moment, yeah. At the moment, the, some, for the project yeah, okay. more at the edge that are kind of changing that stuff, but at the moment that's that's how it operates. So the problem, I think, one of the concerns with Tether is the fact that we know that tip, we know the transactions, the TVLs, where it is, in which DeFi protocol, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what about the whole banking network that is facilitating the issuance, the burning? Can we actually have a perception of who they are? I would say it's we might never have that. All right. Does that bother you or? I mean, I guess those that use that stable coin for reasons of trading, hedging, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, they just have to use it with the knowledge of what is it that they are taking as risk. Right. Um, 
Uh, the so old, it's not like the necessarily I have an opinion <laughs> that, well, we should ban. No, I, I don't no. have that opinion. It's just that not all stable coins are created equal, yeah. if you will. Uh, and that's how it, I see it. it. So if I'm actually using them interchangeably and thinking that they're all the same, I'm actually fooling myself. Sometimes for I'm blindsiding myself or... Uh, for ignorance because they don't understand how they work under the 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 bottom of the iceberg right so so yeah so that's how i see so that's kind of like the first group um then you uh, and that's kind of like what we call like a fiat or or fixed income backed stable coins um and then you have this other group which is like a crypto backed uh stable coins so this is kind of like the original version of Meka and Dai, uh, which was, you know, essentially the very first version was actually backed only by Ethereum, by, by Ether, um, and was running all the time, 24 seven, so long as you have good oracles and you can appreciate what is the price of Ether across all of the markets, then you can see exactly how much of that backing is. The fact that it's backed by something that is much more volatile being ether itself that means that for that stable coin to work all the time you have to have significant over collateralization of the assets right because the asset can as it has done in the past drop by 40 50 percent within a 24-hour period if you had just a kind of over collateralization of five or ten percent then well, you're on the water pretty quickly. Right. So if the price moves by a price, small amount. If the yeah. price moves actually by a next amount in a short period of time, you might not have enough people buying off those assets on the other side as they get liquidated through the protocol, right? So so that's kind of like the crypto backed maker has evolved from that original one, has moved into, you know, multi-collateral DAI, which is still crypto backed loans because it's still ERC-20s, like the liquid ERC-20s, like, you know, Chainlink, etc. Right, you can, you can deposit, um, you can, you can, what can you deposit? Vault, you, devo okay. you deposit, you deposit, say, your, um, your link um, in there, and then you can use that, um, the, the debt that is issued onto you, that it represents the DAI, in this similar way that I like a central bank works in that sense. Yeah. So not so much like the intermediary kind of like banking network that that uh, like USDC and USDC I would put in their bucket more like a, a central bank kind of like yeah, mindset. A, a, so, a central bank, but a central, uh, a, a decentralized central bank a, in a, a contract. A decentralized <laughs> central bank, yeah. So that was kind of like that evolved and then, and then evolved into something now that is a little bit more, kind of, I would say, um, like a mixed between that first backed of, of fiat backed stable and crypto loan backed, so which that, now evolves into you know, like real world assets and yeah. backed by, you know, fixed income. So why would you say it's a, a mix and not just crypto? Is it because it also because now a significant or? portion of it is actually backed by uh, cash and equivalents, okay, um, rather than only crypto backed loans. And so, so how does that work? Is like it's the maker foundation or whatever the organization then converting deposited crypto so yeah so there's a nice work of intermediaries yeah. um, that appear there because um those issues so those bonds they are not um they're not native and what just quickly what's the relationship between maker and die so maker so so there's a few things like there so like the maker maker dao is is there's the MakerDAO Foundation, which was the original kind of like labs, if we will, that bootstrapped the code base of the Maker protocol. You have the MakerDAO, that was this organization that was created to self-govern as a DAO. And then, um, and then you have the counterparties that interact with the DAO, the DAO members, if you will, uh, to filling particular functions. So there's a lot more to it than just, you've got your die. And that's it. Uh, and that's it. And it, yeah. No, there's, there's, there's a lot to that, to that story there of uh, how Maker actually operates. And there's a, quite a few other, um, you know, top 
DeFi protocols that have more or less similar stories in the way that they have evolved. Yeah. Um, originally, the MakerDAO Foundation was actually a big, big thing that actually managed everything, all the functions of the DAO, if you will, with very few exceptions. And they contracted just experts to do some of those functions. So that's the way that I got involved um, with the Maker Protocol. Um, but then has winded down a lot of that kind of like the original foundation um, lab, if you will. And, and then kind of like created um, different entities or like open up requests for <laughs> requests for application, if you will, for yeah. different entities actually to be created to fill in some of those functions that the original foundation used to do. As a DAO, they must be one of the most successful. It must be one of the most successful DAOs. They're probably one of the biggest. Yeah. Probably one of the biggest. Um, it hasn't come without its set of challenges, actually, especially that transition of um, foundation to a DAO. Right. Um, a lot of people that were part of the foundation didn't continue being part of the DAO. They went off to do other things, work on other projects, because they didn't necessarily appreciate the direction or lack sure. of direction that that transformation made. All right. Um, we might come back to some of these points, yep. but let's let's move on. Um, late last year, Janine from Easy Crypto was on the podcast. Of course, it was a big media tour. They were announcing uh, the NZDD mm -hmm. and uh, through a number of uh, intermediaries. I heard that you were a lot involved with this. Um, and so what what can you tell us? Uh, I've got here on my notes, like, what's the story of creating the NZDD? And then I'll just interrupt you along the way. Yeah, so um, so NZDD, um, as, a, as a fiat stable coin, so like following a little bit of like the framework that you see for USDC and others, um, was was originally a way of having, you know, that evolved payment network into also a New Zealand ecosystem, right? So the New Zealand ecosystem is still small, but, and there's like a few players, but there's a bit but of But we history. always punch above our weight. Well, yeah, let's <laughs> <go>. <laughs> <laughs> so the, so, but the NZDD, so the, the intention with that, the goal was actually to have that equivalent of, um, of a, I guess, a digital dollar or a payment a mechanism within the New Zealand um, New Zealand environment. So by you said there to like take advantage of the modern uh, ecosystem, you just mean like uh, the it, difference between blockchain land and traditional finance. Yeah, they, I guess taking advantage of the fact that things have matured, right? So across the spectrum, New Zealand New Zealand, interestingly enough, is actually quite an early stage when it comes to different technologies but but digital assets okay <laughs> um so in that in that area new zealand is is not in that first or i would say possibly not even in the second kind of group of runners right uh, it's not even like it's not a winner it's not a runner up it's in that kind of like more bottom of the scale for its size and what it could be okay in my view right so but um, but the uh, but ac but actually, I think from the um, from the New Zealand digital dollar base, like locally, it's actually quite an innovative idea because essentially there's no one in the marketplace that has really taken that role, right? Of um, hey, we've got also a version of the digital dollar for um, or the digital payment dollar for the local market. Uh, at least not something that has had an opportunity to scale. Right. So, I mean, does the New Zealand market need its own digital dollar or is it just a gap in the market or is it both? The market has matured, right? So the way that actually nowadays it looks at stable coins, which previously it used to look as like, ah, oh, this is just, you know, a crypto bro kind of like thing. Now it has evolved towards, oh, no, this is a settlement, like instant settlement mechanism, work 24-7. We don't have a lot of solutions in the market for that kind of stuff, right? I mean, if you, if you transact between, you and I, we're actually transacting in between two banks. 
um, and I, you know, I pay you a hundred dollars for the grocery bills, but I work, I don't know, I, I'm at ASB and you're at ANZ. I mean, it's you know, when a batch transact for over like, you know, two hours, three hours actually for it, for it. and that's good. Because right. it used to be like, you know, a day or so or something like that. Yeah. Um, and now it all even operates on the weekends. But but what if I say like, oh, this is a 15 second transaction. The, the size of a block, right? It's a very different proposition. So the market has evolved towards actually including stable coins in the realm of digital payments evolution, right? And in New Zealand took a long time to understand that that was the end goal. So now I think Janine and, and folks at Easy Crypto, they have said, well, have like seen the lens of the market, seen the brand that Easy Crypto has in the market because there's not a lot of yeah, that's a good strong point. brands in the market. That'll help. This, that, that helps, right? Uh, and saying, yeah, actually, I think that makes sense to have that op option as well. For, for the local market and, and and that potentially creates also like a bridge All right, to international so, markets to other stable coins that are really more more pervasive, like, you know, the ESDCs and the dies of the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can see it as being very sort of business or banker friendly mm. uh, for that reason. You've got loads of benefits of being on whatever whatever chain that, that you're using at that time. Um, plus, you don't have to worry about uh, anything else because you already probably have practices in place for the New Zealand dollar. So if you've got a digital version of it, then you don't have to also, you know, have a team to, you know, investigate the risk and the stability and the, the implications. You still have to structure things properly, um, right? Because you you need to you need to understand that the that is still is utilizing the you know the intermediary banking network for 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 its management. Right, so you still need to make sure that um, whoever you're interacting with, and we might come back to that later when we talk about deep hacking and things like that, that you're working with good counterparties, right? Yep. Because, I mean, we're still not having um, a player interacting directly with that central bank cash. It's still private money, right? So it's different. So <laughs> uh, that, that that brings risk. Um, I was I get, thinking about it. You know, so um, just on this point, I, th I was thinking about this, and I think it's quite related, right? It's that a private company can create a New Zealand dollar, hmm. right? And you're kind of like you're kind of like capturing that brand of the New Zealand dollar, hmm. right? Without proper authority. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th the reality is that banks have done this for. A long, long time. I mean, when, uh, again, coming back to the example of yeah. uh, ASB and Z, actually, what I'm sending to you is not central bank money. I'm not actually sending my central bank money to your central bank money backed by full faith of the New Zealand government. What I'm sending to you is the private money issued by ASB wrapped around their credit risk that I'm telling you, here is my private money from SB, a clearing house is in the middle, writing, yep, $100 debit from ASB's account, $100 credit to ANZ yeah. account, ANZ accepts that money, a private version of that money from ASB on its own account. So. If you think about yeah, that, uh, the whole you, thing is and, wild. And, and, you th <laughs> and you think about that in the context yeah. of USDC or USDT okay. trading or curve, all that kind of stuff. I mean, we're probably not going to go too much off rails here, but but it's actually that private money already exists, except that now what we're doing is actually I'm wrapping up a private money with another version of a private money yeah. that just has instant settlement. All right, so let's get some okay. let's get some dollars in my wallet here. If I want a hundred, oh, let's go bigger. If I want a thousand New Zealand DD NZDD, yeah. Um, what are the, what are the mechanics? So I go to uh, I have an Easy Crypto wallet, so I can like see the option to buy it in in the wallet. Um, what are the mechanics in order to get that NZDD token in my wallet? 
Okay. If I'm sending them money from my ASB account. Okay. So, um, so use like the, the frameworks that are, you know, present in most um, reserve, like um, fiat backed stable coins, and there's, there's a lot of like commonality there. So, as a, as a retail user, like so, as a Jeff, you know, Jeff is a guy that is kind of like doing the thing with um, interacting with the New Zealand industry. Yeah, right? very predictable uh, <laughs> patterns in, in my bank account. Yeah. So, you, uh, Jeff, what you're doing is either you are uh, um, buying that USDT, uh, USDD on the secondary market, so through an exchange, for example, like Easy Crypto being an exchange. Um, or you're receiving that from a third party, right? So like the third party actually has some dollars on their account and is actually sending that NZDD to you. You, Jeff, because you're a retail, you are not doing the same thing that, for example, you would do if you interacted with DAI, right? where you could go and you have, you, Jeff, have your own vault and you use that vault to deposit whatever asset in there and receive that die. It's not the way that it operates usually with um, fiat backed stable coins. You don't have access to be a market maker, if you will, as a, as a retail person. Wholesale is a little bit different, and that's where the kind of like most of the liquidity comes from. And um, presumably behind the scenes, they've you know signed up some accounting intern to keep track of the books, right? So uh, on a larger scale, if I go look. You know, if I go look on chain and I can see how many NZDD are in issuance on a on a certain chain, um, where is the where is the assurance that there's really fiat and equivalents in the background? Yeah. So because of the uh, fiat back stables, they operate uh, with the that off chain market, the banking the banking uh, network. What you and and that the banking network, you I mean, you, you know, it's run on each of the bank's ledgers and databases, etc., you don't have, um, like, as a as someone that is actually using uh, a stable coin, you don't have that kind of like a real-time view of how that ledger on the bank is being updated. But you do use a similar mechanism that the central bank uses when it audits a bank. It usually what it does, it appoints a third party, trusted, trusted independent third party, like a big four accounting firm, like UI, PwC, et cetera. Yep. Um, and tells them, you got the mandate to go and oversee and report back on uh, the assets and liabilities of that entity. And that's what you see, for example, like when you look into um, circle and USDC, you go the backing, you go and look like there's a real time kind of view of what the auditor is telling that is in that banking account that has been set for that purpose. Uh, would you say treasury? Would you say this is a proof of reserves or is that's a that's a reserve? Yeah, yeah. that's proving proving that the reserves and actually there is more assets than liabilities actually sitting in that account. Oh. If that's not, you're insolvent. Okay, so, so if, and, and therefore, you're, yeah, stable coin actually loses its value. What, okay, let's one more thing on the mechanics, and then, then we'll move on. How does in a market system? How does one of these? Let's take. You could take any example you want of a stable coin. How does it stay stable, like at at whatever it's supposed to be at at a dollar? Yeah. So so here we have like just to look at. One thing is actually the backing, right? So like the reserves, the cash and equivalents that are actually backing a stable coin. The other thing is the, the, the dynamics on the token itself and where it's trading, what it's doing. Is it like uh, in a lot of DeFi trading platforms or CeFi trading platforms? That, might, that could be in a short period of time, slight fluctuations between the two. Right. And there's a lot of trading and arbitrage that actually happens in that market. Right? On the reserve side of things, so long as that reserve is well managed, like from a treasury perspective, from a treasurer that is actually looking after those reserves and is actually audited frequently, 
those reserves are there. And so long as there's also like, you got some rules around what is it that you can do with the reserves, and those rules are actually transparent and overseen, you should be okay. Yep. You just don't want actually people to go, ah, case. You don't possible, want someone to... Possible re- hypothetical case of tether, I'm going to invest in stocks. Right, you don't want, to, you don't go want to go in. off that rail, right? And then someone gets a call saying, hey, we need to sell... Yeah, exactly. I mean, stocks. stocks have dropped by 30% yeah. today. We have like a market crash. Oh, okay, so all of a sudden your, uh, your assets actually are lowered in a liability. I mean, sorry for, for the French, but that's essentially what yeah. it means. So you, you want to have like some strict rules, right? So those rules for across the world and up until this point, with very few exceptions, they have not been enforced onto stablecoin issues. That's changing. What is it that they can and cannot do if they want to be licensed and regulated to do that stuff? So that's changing. There's a few jurisdictions that were ahead of the pack. New Zealand is one of, not one of them. But I guess there is an understanding, right? Because we are who we are. We're a village, right? So people <laughs> still talk to each other and they talk to regulators, especially if they want to do that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, so that's the, the part. On the token side, the token side is, it might be a little bit different, right? So you can have um, several types of risks that actually come out of that. So one of them is the fact that maybe your token is trading on a mochi chain, right? And the pricing and fluctuations and the liquidity on those markets are not all equal. Yeah, that sounds like a headache, actually. You might have like some of that actually trading on Ethereum. Most people actually launch on Ethereum before launch everybody, uh, everywhere else. Uh, that is actually kind of like there is a more mature market. There is more two side of the trade with a lot of liquidity in pools. For example, like you know Curve, Uniswap, etc. Right. And therefore, that doesn't fluctuate much a lot. But you could have an equivalent of an AMM that doesn't have a lot enough liquidity providers, where that fluctuation might be a little bit bigger. Right, because you're having balance within those pools uh, in another network that doesn't have enough liquidity. Of course, then arbitrageurs are actually are making money on that, and eventually that market matures, hopefully, unless it gets hacked before. And we can talk about hacks <laughs> later on. But um, but yeah, so you, well, it has to, right? There's only two ways it can go. It yeah, can, yeah, it can mature or, or potentially die, or just, I mean, not necessarily go out of existence, just kind of like go flat and. And kind of like okay. appear out of without a catastrophic event. without necessarily a catastrophic okay. event. Not not all stable coins finish with a deep pack and a, a catastrophic event and people losing money. Not all of them. So yeah, just that's true. You, you look at the list, and it's a very long list. But then you look at the the volume, or you look at the, you know the liquidity available, and mm. um, depending on what you want to do, you need to be careful with how much is in that market. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about these catastrophic events when when things go wrong. Um, I mean, terrible if you're directly affected by them, but from an observer, you know, there's always lots of things happening in crypto and f- from, as an observer, very interesting events. Um, so I gave you a short list here to, to talk about, um, let's, let's go in like reverse chronological order. Uh, recently USDC had a, a short event. Um, I was reading a Coindesk article this morning on January 4th. There was some news that the uh, Bitcoin ETF would not be approved. Mm. Um, And uh, the headline here is that USDC spiked down to 74 cents on Binance. And if you look at the um, if you look at the data, it looks like it only lasted about 10 minutes, like a short, a short deviation. What what do you what do you make of that? Yeah. So, again, coming back to that kind of dynamic that things actually have managed on off chain world and the token that is essentially the representation on chain, right? So just again, people are talking a lot about real world assets today. The first representation for real world assets is actually is a stable coin. Of course that parent apparently we can we can go back <laughs> later. But but what you what you see, so you have like those two. You have like the off chain and the, the the on chain world there. The biggest risks um, for a stablecoin provider um, are still what happens off chain, right? So, for example, the case of what happened with uh, USDC uh, in March 2023, 
right? So everybody was kind of like quite panicked because it's like, oh my God, you know, USDC, he is, he was kind of almost on par at that point in time with Tether uh, in terms of like market cap. And, and it was the most kind of like trusted if you want to hold, not if you want to trade. Again, people use stable coins for different things. Right. They might use Tether for trading, but USDC more like for holding it as if it was dollar. Um, at that point in time, there was a kind of like a, a bit of like a loss of trust, right? Like what's going on here, right? And then, and then the peg, the peg to 90 cents and stay there for two, three days, right? So that's related to uh, a banking failure on the intermediary. So yeah, off Silicon, chain. Silicon Valley Bank yeah. and a lot of like the lower tier banks in the US. Um, a few of them actually had like some troubles on their balance sheets uh, related to the fact that they had a lot of like long-term bonds and actually interest rates were rising, right? So they're like, oh my God, they had all of a sudden they had a problem. Um, SVB went down and SVB held about $3 billion worth of, uh, of the reserve that was actually backing USDC. Significant portion at that point in time because like USDC had about $25 billion, I think, or close to $30 billion. Yeah, that's a big portion you're talking about. It's a big 10 percent You're talking so? about almost 10, almost 10 percent. I think it was actually 9 percent or something like yep. that. So therefore, therefore, almost, you know, replicated with the DPEG of almost 90 cents, right, on, on chain. This was like an off-chain kind of failure, which caused, in my view, for two reasons. So one reason is, of course, the bank went down. And that's the kind of the counterparty that has low credit risk. I mean, if you look at the books of SVB, it was really like more like a fintech startup than an actual commercial bank, well right. seen by the regulator. When you look at how how it operates, again, can come back to that. Well, but they were famously we're crypto that. friendly. Yeah, too. So, yeah, but it were crypto friendly, right? So VCs and and everybody else actually kind of used them if they were doing things in the digital asset space in the US. The offside of that story is that, hey, it was also the responsibility of the issuer of the stable coin to body up with good custodians of their money. It's not only the fault of SBB. It was also actually the guy that is actually allocating money and having partnerships with banks actually to go in like, are you a AAA rated bank or yep. are you a close to default type one? Anyways. And they're trying to evaluate like evaluate. these. Yeah. They have adapted since then, and they were lucky that the um, the regulator in the United States, so in this case here, uh, the supervisor of the bank in the United States intervened uh, to make whole um, all of the asset holders in that bank. And therefore, yeah, cool. USDC came, came back to PEG. But right. there is that people saying, could breathe again and they were like, it's yeah. But then there's a kind of like post that people there's a saying in the stable coin world that you only depeg once. USDC got lucky that they depegged and they still came back to kind of a trust. Trust that re was reverted that most stable coins weren't that lucky actually to depeg once and regain trust. Right, an event like that would- An event like that actually- It's great killer. confidence and it's so easy to move your money. Finish, fin finishes the confidence, right? Once people actually kind of like, um, they were lucky that it was a well surveilled bank and the actions that the regulator took at that point in time were, uh, were speedy enough over that period of a weekend where everybody was like asking themselves, oh my God, you know, did I lo just lose 10% of like the money that I thought that I had in the RSTC or what, what happened, right? Anyways, so this is a kind of like a, a call, of, um, call of caution. And I think your circle has taken other measures since then to, to try to reevaluate how they allocate actually the money, you know, uh, through relationships with higher tier, uh, uh, banks and asset managers. Do you think that Circle will maintain their dominance in this area? They are definitely kind of a very innovative um, kind of startup. I mean, they are not a startup anymore. They've been around for a little while, but 
they are definitely a very kind of like engineering focused company that I think they are quite aware of their role as the kind of go to trusted payment payment kind of stable point mechanism. Uh, but they have some some challengers coming up um, in term that actually can really challenge them. Um, PayPal, of course, with yeah. their own stable coin in the U.S. Uh, but also um, they've kind of the, risen. Also the banks, quite quick. Also the banks, yeah, because the banks are actually are issuing their own stable coins at the moment. They're all using on wholesale, not so much retail facing. A lot of them actually are doing, uh, and banks. Uh, issuing what we call like a um, deposit tokens, which are more like a certificates of deposit equipment. Um, I think this is going to be a real challenge. I, you know, I worked as part of Maker work with the SOCGEN group, which is a Société Générale. It's like the, one of the biggest banking groups in France. Uh, and they've issued, uh, issued they actually their own stable coin after working with Maker to learn. <laughs> they learned and they, they did on their own. Um, so, and there's very equivalent, many equivalents of those in Australia. Anyway, so so, so that's the one part, and the other part is more the uh, the token itself, right? Yeah. So, if the token gets trapped into some uh, uh, some pool on some smart contract, and that smart contract is exploitable, then the stablecoin could also lose its peg. Or if the stablecoin is trading on a C5 platforms, uh, but at different prices, that's what's happening now with True USD, um, where there's actually different pricing, literally, in different mechanisms, actually in, in different C5 platforms and different exchanges. And then there was a lot of traders actually trading True USD at 95 cents in, in other. If I would say, oh, but it's still actually close to a dollar. So you can buy a TUSD at so 95. So like recursive trading. <laughs> and you can Between. sell it <laughs> somewhere else for... Arbitrage for, trading. For a dollar. Uh, right. And um, so there's, that can also bring loss of confidence. Um, okay. What about UST? UST, this is the uh, Terra Luna stable coin. Stable is uh, in quotes there, right? Yeah. Uh, that never recovered. Uh, and, um, you know, contributed in large to massive meltdown that we had yeah. coming up two years now, two years ago now. Yeah, it's, um, it's starting to date now. And so people right. tend to forget because short term. So maybe attention. I don't know how you I don't know how you want to start that, but maybe uh, you can tell us, is that an algorithmic stable coin? Yeah. So that's a type of stable coin that we didn't kind of like cover in the first part, um, which is they have like the they work as a. As a, um, as a mechanism they their own, they're separate from the other groups like crypto-backed and reserve-backed and mixed ones. These ones are more like what I call like a algorithm or senior stable coins. Those senior stable coins, essentially the way that they work is actually they you they usually kind of like two, two sets, right? So you have one set of smart contracts that is used to issue a equity like um, mechanism in this case here it was Terra right so we're going to print you something and yeah we're going to print you something and then you actually you can recursively increase by burning that Terra the value of the stable coin and so long as you have a balance of supply and demand between those two this thing here that is supposed to make to be stable that is backed by this other thing that is equity then we're fine if that comes out of balance, that's when uh, you expect traders to come on and arbitrage on the difference. Yeah. Um, but if that goes really, really wrong, then that's when a DPEG kind of happens. And that's what we're talking the case of Terra, like the death spiral that happened there. What essentially happened is that there was actually some, some pools that were actually traded on Curve. So Curve being a um, a stable coin AMM, a uh, stable coin fixed AMM. And there was a group of traders that front run uh, the trade of Terra at that point in time. It was a significant volume of trade. 
And that caused those that were holding the equity to lose trust on the value of the equity that was backing that stable coin like that. The reserve there actually kind of like lose its value downwards. And because traders start actually losing that, they start actually selling that equity at a volume and mass very quickly yeah. within a short period of time. And for the stable coin here in the backing, again, if your assets are lower than your liabilities, you're insolvent. So they actually they started actually spiraling up on, on traders. The fact that actually the backing of it was winding down. And then they, they started actually selling a mass and that saw actually the, the stable coin actually the pegging further. So they saw faster yeah. <laughs> and so on. So it was very quick, right? There was, was no just, recovery. Yeah. There was no recovery Good. for that kind of mechanism. Yeah, the, the equilibrium is lost. And I mean, if you can follow what the traders are doing and if you can mm. see see what's happening there, they can be they it can be quite telling. Yeah, in, that's right. Situations like this. But the initiator was that front running of the trade that happened on the AMM. Because it was someone that knew that a trade was coming out of like some multi-sig. And that front run that by actually by taking the other side of the market, like almost like a short squeeze in reverse. I like that's, that. That's essentially what happened at, at the beginning of Terra. Um, yeah. And uh, why do you think these coins that die, uh, UST, are still trading? Like you can still see, I mean, it's thin volume, but you can still see prices of two cents on yeah. CoinGecko. <laughs> so uh, I think, I think now. These DGENs? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's just... DGENs or like, you know, youth farmers um, that are actually are doing that kind of stuff and creating some wrapper on secondary yeah. trading platforms yeah. uh, and trade much, much like people trade, um, how do you call it, like penny stocks, right? Yeah, okay. So essentially like penny stocks, a lot of people know, well, this company is about to be winded down or there's not a lot of transparency in terms of reporting and things like this. And then you have like a bunch of traders that are actually just making money on a day trading of penny stocks. It's very similar, I think, to that. And the fact yeah. that nobody ever kind of like killed those smart contracts, those tokens will be there forever. As you're saying, like there's just like... As long as the blockchain can still process the transactions. As long as the blockchain keeps actually computing <laughs> all of that kind of stuff, they will be absolutely there forever. So, uh, you've mentioned a few times about real world assets. This is, uh, this, it's gotta be the, I mean, aside from the Bitcoin ETF, it's gotta be like the buzzword that's all over right now. Uh, and then you met, and then you mentioned about how obviously stable coins are representations of real world assets mm. that have been tokenized. Um, what about tokenized securities is, is it all buzz or is there no, What's happening there? No, there is actually. So, um, so I guess just like to bring a little bit more to um, to the personal personal story. So, like for me, um, when I started actually working with the, with the maker output protocol, um, I was brought in once because of like background and stuff that I had done in banking and in the in the Ethereum community. But second, because of that, oh, eventually we want to this protocol into that, you know, capital markets, right? And finance the capital markets and back. Let's use back this as a template to... As a, as a template, let's use the same underlying kind of like platform actually to invest essentially into um, into the capital market securities. So, so in that, we started that in 2020, in 2019, early 2020. That's when I can like a... Uh, a group was spun out of what originally was the quantitative risk team into, hey, let's structure stuff in the actual real capital markets. Let's let's get the meaty stuff, not only the speculative <laughs> stuff. Um, and um, and so that's kind of like I, I think also a lot of the terminology that we use nowadays, like uh, real world assets, which is not something that I like okay. particularly, <laughs> but it's the one that actually everybody kind of like can relate to. Yeah, I, mean, started, it, I, I think it might have started out of that team, to be honest, because we started kind of like communicating as real world assets and every, everything else. Anyways, long story, bringing back to today. Um, we went for 
a pretty long time, I would say close to two years, with not much attention, despite very interesting stuff that we were doing um, with, uh, you know, the likes of Centrifuge and, um, and other, you know, now RWA platforms yeah. that actually are starting to pop up in the market, right? So the likes of Centrifuge worked like with Maple, Finance, Gold, Finch, et cetera, et cetera. So a few of those that were also doubling with um, utilizing pools to invest into uh, emerging market securities or types of debt, mostly debt, not so much equity yet at that point in time. And um, did a lot of experimentation in that space. Eventually with the combination, I think, of the banking group in, in France that, um, that said, hey guys, we, we issued this security here that actually backs off our real estate. They have like a, several billion dollars of real estate in their, in their banking uh, loan portfolio. And, um, and they issued this highly graded like triple way security for the market on the Ethereum blockchain, they did that. And we want to use a portion of that to back DAI. And we want to use the DAI protocol I should to do because we've been seeing all of the experimentation that you guys have been doing over the last couple of years. Oh, been, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, so that was actually interesting. And we, it was not the only bank. I won't mention the other ones for their own privacy, but there was actually quite a few banks actually in the same kind of like pool also kind of, they were trying to innovate uh, for different use cases and so on. Um, so all of that kind of experimentation kind of like went on into, you know, small end stages. And then when actually that French bank actually came around, hey, a French bank is, you know, pledging $30 million worth of collateral for the MakerDAO protocol, protocol, all of the other banks around the world. It's like, whoa, what's that? Because this is a systemic bank, right? They were critically involved in the whole, um, I don't know if you remember that, but like back in 2000. 13, 2014, when actually the Greek crisis in the European Union actually happened, they were very, very deeply involved. So this is a very systemic bank. It's one that regulators don't don't. They were, they were involved they, in helping they, or they, they were involved in, they were? They were involved because they had a lot of securities that they that they managed they from the, the, southern, the southern European yeah, um, okay. uh, countries, right? Um, and they're, they're global significant anyways. So all of these other banks and went around, so like, What's going on that actually, you know, Sock Jam is doubling with this DeFi thing. They must be something in there, right? And then the calls started ringing. It's like, oh, we want to use case X, we use case Y, and so on. Now, two years into the future, it's becoming a narrative that is self-fulfilling on its own. But it's a different, different market, different dynamics, right? Because all of a sudden you have like capital markets, mostly that coming on chain, but not coming on chain the way that actually the crypto markets actually believe that they're going to come on chain. They're coming on chain much more like in the way that USDC coming on chain. So again, the, Very actual, organized. the actual capital, the actual issuance is all done off chain by those counterparties that manage assets nowadays, like the Black Rocks, etc. And there is a second record of registry that is the blockchain. But it's again, I repeat, it's a second record. It's not the native issuance record of a blockchain. And the management and the management of cycle, uh, cycle of those assets is also off chain for the most part. There's only a representation of it. That's why there is still quite a bit of friction that is for those that actually work with DeFi and they like to compose transactions and do this and that, they don't see so much of that actually happening in the so real world. So what's the goal here space. then? Like what's the benefit? Well, so for there's a few things. Um, there's actually the good, the good benefits of it, um, like the I guess positive outcomes for the capital market, and there's also some some negatives that uh, I think uh, we we saw that from that early stage and they are continuing. Um, so on the on the positive, I guess on the positive side of the capital market, so they are looking at different use cases here. So one of them is um, fast uh, fast settlement, right? So whereas actually right now in the same way that you know USDC you can settle it like twenty four seven, 
the same thing like you can settle some of those securities uh, possibly 24 7 without necessarily having an opening of the market at 9 a.m. and closing at 5 p.m. across the world. So there's a benefit to it, right? If you want to trade those securities, you can trade all the time without necessarily having the futures. Make the futures that is essentially regulated what is happening when markets are closed, right? So there's, there's part of it. Uh, so there's liquidity. So previously where you had parts of the market that weren't actually so much um, being served by liquidity by market makers because there was too much friction. Now those, uh, for example, like startups, they can issue liquidity into a more kind of a public-like pool. So joining forces. Be uh, joining forces. For because, I mean, you, you know that majority of startups and, and companies that actually are less mature and that are private, they don't get to enjoy the same kind of like liquidity, either either issuing debt or equity. They don't get to enjoy the same liquidity as um, as those that actually are in the public markets, right? Because the market is not as deep, and therefore um, the the asks for those that invest those companies is like yeah. a ton because they're all doing kind of due diligence on the digital first startup. But if you bring some of the public-like features of the markets into a private market, now all of a sudden you create a bigger pool of liquidity. You and I, or most of retail investors, they don't have exposure actually to private companies. They invest into Tesla, Microsoft, etc., but they don't invest so much into private companies. And, to, and that's a feature in a way, because a lot of that actually requires much more <laughs> sophisticated with much more sophistication to see where the trouble signs are and and how to do the diligence. Nobody actually tells you, oh, this is the this is the handbook of how to do the diligence. Right. There's company. no quarterly. There's no yeah. There's no yeah. There's no textbook for that stuff. You know, like it's baked on experience. Um, that's why a lot of companies specialize in doing that with uh, you know hundreds of analysts and so on. So <clears throat> so yeah. So the, so there's liquidity. There's uh, in, um, um, settlement. There's portfolio management as well. There's a few banks actually working on that area where, for example, where before to do your portfolio rebalancing every end of the month or every end of the quarter, and you would have like a bunch of analysts going and reviewing all those books. What if you actually programmatically actually set that so that at the end of the month, a smart contract is coded to just rebalance the portfolio? Seems so obvious. It's a pretty yeah. huge automation. Yeah. Uh, JP Morgan actually is working on that stuff and has done an interesting presentation at the end of last year. You'd be very nervous the first time it happens, but yeah, but I mean the cost savings that they are making, so like they're already making some cost savings. So there's a interesting use case, and this is all public information, so no worries about disclosing any of that stuff. These reports, I can send that to you if you want to share with um with the people in the program. But JP Morgan actually. Uh, Buddied up with Apollo and Wisdom Tree, I believe he was, um, and they and they essentially did an experiment around Apollo being the asset manager and actually J.P. Morgan Onyx that has built a platform that includes also real assets. They essentially they calculated that they have saved something ridiculous amount of money, like just the portfolio rebalancing and monitoring, it was like fifty percent less cost for the bank. And that's just to, like a regular to, activity that they and have just to a go regular through. activity that they have to do for the investors. Yeah. Every you know every every period of time, and all of a sudden, that tokenization there served as the mechanism to transform into a same similar platform those traditional assets and the alternative assets, including crypto, into one tokenized kind of security, which they rebalance and monitor on a monthly basis. It's an automation thing, right? Yeah. It's more like an automation thing than actually the kind of like the the crypto web, web three dream yeah, of Yeah, you're using the programmability. Decentralization. Programmability. Using the efficiency in the network. Correct, yeah. Not in, So that's why kind of like this network is evolving with all shapes and flavors that don't necessarily resemble the dreams of you know the decentralization and all that kind of stuff even though that exists 
right? Like from an organization point of view and from a smart contracting network point of view that exists, but that also is living in parallel with all of these other use cases that are way more focused on automation, cost reduction, et cetera. Um, and they're kind of like almost, they're progressing as two know, worlds is just in parallel. It's right? boring, right? Or it's, it, 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 it sounds boring, boring right? It's boring, but yeah, it's you can boring. save but, that money. <laughs> but but it, they are doing that like this. So like they're saving that money but then you have also like a whole set of parties operating in the um, in the tokenization space where they are in the between. So they are the guys that are kind of like wrapping up some of those securities and chucking them into the DeFi markets or using the DeFi markets actually to pour liquidity. Yeah, into that the sounds space. more fun to me. Yeah, so that ha that is happening. Yeah. The thing with that one. And that's when it kind of like coming more like to maybe some of the downsides of it um, is that that can also be made, uh, can be done as a mechanism to chuck some poor assets that no one wants to, to deal right. with. And those that, again, market asymmetry in terms of knowledge, those that actually are knowledgeable that those are uh, poor assets are way more incentivized to dump those assets into a market that is less sophisticated about actually its valuation. And then you can see where it keeps me awake at night is that you could have like several terrors and all that kind of stuff of just things actually being dumped, but terror equivalents from the off-chain world being dumped into a market as kind of a rubbish siphon well, that market keeps the good stuff for itself as a portfolio rebalancing mechanism, dumps into a market that doesn't know how to evaluate those assets, and that market just is speculating on the fact that thinks that these are great assets. And that eventually that market, when some more sophisticated actors in that market that is providing liquidity, figures out, oh, this is all shit. <laughs> We're building a house of cards. Well, we saw this with <laughs> CDOs and different <laughs> trenches. Exactly. And and I tell you, like a lot of that stuff is already there. Okay. CDOs, CLOs, and CDOs squared. A lot of that and the programmability and the smart contracts for it have already been done. They're just not operating on, on rails with the scale of the CDOs that we had in 2018, uh, 2008. Um, but they are already there and, and the people and the, um, and I guess like the, the skill sets um, that did a lot of that um, product um, design from back in 2008, they are already operating in the, in the Web3 market. What are you excited about coming up either short term or long term in crypto the, my biggest my biggest kind of project and aim at the moment um this is like a long term because it will take time uh for me is opening up the capital market infrastructure so that it operates as close as possible to the way that the five markets actually operate so what i mean by that is so then, like, if you think about the, the stable coin, so all of the asset allocation, um, asset allocation, treasury management, um, redemption, um, relationship with counterparties that make the off-chain part of stable coin operate, bring on-chain proofs to all of that activity. So that actually market participants, they can see trouble or the market issuer uh, can see trouble before trouble arrives or the market issuer can actually um, prove that they are doing their actions at the right time because they are on chain proofs of actually what is happening there and transforming that in a programmable way. For me, this and this is a lot of, and the same thing that actually happens for a stablecoin, in terms of market infrastructure, also happens to all types of 
uh, real world assets. So you want to crack it all open, crack so it all up crack, for analysis. Crack it all open, so that actually the trust embedded mechanism can actually have on-chain replicability of the whole workflow that happens in there. Is this something that an institution or a sector is in favor of? Yeah, there's a few institutions that actually are keen for that because they know that once they once they are operating in a market that is open, they don't want to spend all of that money saying to the UIs and to the PWCs, et cetera, or the big four of the world to spend a whole bunch of time kind of doing all of these assessments over and over and over and just clipping tickets on a daily basis, mm -hmm. right? I like that. that. Right, so it's like, uh, I mean, why you clip tickets if the whole market actually can, uh, can observe what's going on in there? You don't need an auditor. It self audits. It self audits and it's in near real time. And yeah, I mean, you still have to bring all of the tools and, and make sense of all of those tools, right? I mean, uh, on its own, it takes time to build all of that infrastructure, but eventually actually having all of that infrastructure on chain, eventually we're not even call, we're gonna call anything actually real world assets or, or tokenized assets, we're just gonna call them assets. Uh, blue sky thing again. That's that, that, that's, my, yeah. that's my, my, my key focus at the moment. Okay. Is observing all of the evolution that includes CBD6 as well. Got a couple of rapid fire questions yeah, to wrap us up here. Um, ETF in Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum coming up. Is it net positive? What, oh, what that's a big one. <laughs> I think um, net positive from the sense that uh, probably like the Bitcoin one, the term might be a little bit different, but um, the Bitcoin one, I think it's a net positive from the point of view that a lot of people don't want to manage yeah. keys and manage all that kind of stuff. And they're not having anything in their portfolios that allow them to have like an exposure to something that actually can boost their portfolios, even if a very small location. So I think that's very, a net positive, a net positive from the point of view that also like, uh, people that actually, uh, like, um, like, I guess, funds that actually manage important stuff for our lives, like, you know, long-term stuff, 30, 40 years time, most people don't think about their retirement Pensions, when they are 20 so years important. old. Pensions, yeah. that they are only going to think about, you know, in 40 years time when they're about to retire or something. I think it's important that they have being able to have access to the assets at their level of risk tolerance without having to manage any of these kids. I mean... You know, if, if I leave the house or, or if I like a, sometimes when actually I, I'm, you know, I, I have to, every time I actually have to explain to my wife how actually, how this, this keys operate and how multi saves and all that kind of stuff they operate. I was like, fuck, oh my God, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy that I'm alive, right? <laughs> it was like, so it, it gives exposure to everybody, right? To some of those assets, even if they don't want to think about it. Most people don't think about their, the composition of their portfolios for, that is managed by their pension funds. Uh, okay, we, got, we got other stuff to think about, yeah. Yeah, got other stuff to think about. And you just hope that your fund is doing the right thing because you're only going to look at it maybe when you're 60, when you're like, oh, I'm thinking about retiring. What? I lost all of that money because I didn't invest in the right stuff for 40 years every, every <laughs> month. I clipped the ticket, you know? Like, so, so I think that's really... That opens up that market for it. Um, the downside, and I think this is where I guess maybe some um, like Bitcoin maxes and, and so on, they might get a little bit disappointed is that eventually BlackRock is gonna actually own the network. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, we're gonna be sorry for them because they are gonna yeah. manage most of it. Um, um, so that's going to be the downside because then people are like, well, okay. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the fact that we can talk about it me, and like envision it yeah. means that there's a chance that, yeah. I mean, go that a, way. there's a significant <laughs> chance that that's going to be the case. Um, if all the outstanding issuance of Bitcoin, um, I mean, at the moment, like I saw some figures, but like they are buying five times what the outstanding issuance of it, it is at the moment. If you just extrapolate over the next 10 years, it's almost a guarantee that they are going to own most of the network. Yeah, they are. A, yeah, they're a big black rock, aren't uh, they? <laughs> yeah, so so it's going to be, yeah, yeah. I mean, from that point of view, I think people just have to be okay potentially with, with that. 
um, and maybe some of the upsides or downsides that it comes with in terms of market dominance and hopefully not market manipulation, but that's, that's to be seen. Uh, that can be fun too, though. <laughs> so. Given all the uh, sort of different stablecoin mechanisms or mechanics or different ways people have done it, do you have something that you think is interesting, maybe we haven't talked about today that people might want to look into? 100%. Um, so for me, um, after after seeing all of the stuff that, you know, like Maker has done, Circle and other stablecoin issuers have done in the market, I think we're like probably the most, I guess, uh, still to this day, the most interesting use case for for Maker in terms of like what is it that it proved to the market it was possible is what it did with single collateral die, like the kind of the purest view of yep. die backed by just Maker one asset, die. one asset and one significant African asset in the network. I think that that is a very interesting use case, it proved that something can live 24 seven, highly liquid, um, highly perceivable. I think now um, a lot of stables that actually are becoming kind of like multi-asset stables, I think that creates other types of risks, which I think the whole ecosystem would be maybe more sound to have single collateral assets that gave the same level of transparency and observability and auditability that single collateral die had, right? So, and I think this is also a chance for even like future stablecoin issuers to try to replicate that even if they are centralized entity. And again, that's bringing back to that idea of any part of the same ecosystem of idea of concepts is the uh, that open market protocol that I was talking about in terms of protocols that prove all of those things on chain, it would be essentially a version of single collateral die, but also for centralized issuance, mm -hmm. <laughs> which maybe hof hopefully some projects in the, I guess, even in the CBDC world actually could try to double with that kind of stuff. So I think that might eliminate some of the I guess some of the or, or worries and, and misconceptions that people have around um, CBDCs and uh, governance relations, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, if they did that kind of stuff, then I guess it might, might be a bit of my, like market trust. My uh, last question I ask most of my guests, Yeah. Uh, who is Satoshi? Oh, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I I don't know. Have you can tell me after we stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I I I, I but I, I do believe that actually Satoshi uh, might be a group of people rather than a specific individual, um, and I, I think the reason why I believe that is that someone needed to be witty enough. And in, in, I guess in like have a, like an open minded view enough to combine, you know, a view of the future, digital cash, technology understanding and in market financial markets understanding all in one person. I think it's pretty hard to have the variety of skill sets that were required to build something like Bitcoin. Um, unless I'm over speculating on how what stable coin, uh, what Bitcoin has become, but up until this day, is it still the asset of um, is, the, is it still the primary asset for the ecosystem, even if it doesn't have DeFi and you know, all the the crazy and nice stuff mm -hmm. that we actually would like to interact with, but is it still it's the king? Is it still the king? Right? Yeah. Is it still the king, and no one is dethroning it? So, so people will hold it for whatever, uh, over whatever other alternative asset for the foreseeable future. So I think, yeah, I, th I, I definitely think it's actually a group of people. Could still be actually very smart, you know, computer scientists from MIT or USLA or whatever, but I still think it's a group, not a, not a one individual that actually did that.
you know, maybe the David Chums and a few other guys that all got together and, and, and built this because they were already yeah. doubling with digital cash That's for right. a while before there. So, yeah. All right, well, we'll leave it there. Thank you yeah. very much for coming in. No worries, mate. Cheers. Thanks for joining us, folks. Look out for the next episode of the Blockchain New Zealand podcast, probably in the same spot you found this one. Cheers. Cheers.